I want you to turn with me to the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 27. It is our custom in our church to stand for the reading of God's word. And so I see no reason why we should break with that custom on today. It's been the last time we'll ask you to stand until it's time for you to go. But for just these few moments while we read the infallible word of God, I want you to stand for the reading of God's word. Y'all feel good? Y'all feel all right? All right, let's do it. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 15. I hear pages turning. That's so encouraging. You know, everybody uses their electronic devices now, but to hear pages turn, that's old school. That means some folks still believe in their old school. Pull out your Bible. Y'all remember you used to have your, your Bible would have colored notes and stuff that God would be telling you things. You have notes to yourself. Amen. Handling the scriptures, handling the word of God. Some of y'all, y'all be in trouble if your devices go down. Child, you couldn't find John 3.16. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 27. I'm going to be reading out of ESV, the English Standard Version of the Bible. It may look a little bit different from yours if you're using King James or some other version, but I wanted to use this so that we could, wouldn't have to trip over those uh, King's English as we're trying to grab, grasp a thought here. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Drop down to verse 20. Now, the chief priests and the elders, they persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas. It's always your own people, ain't it? It's always your own people. Now the chief priests and the elders, they persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, now I'm giving you a chance to get out of this. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said again, Barabbas. So Pilate said to them, then, what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. I want to drop back to that part in from 21st verse where the governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, release to us Barabbas. And I, I, I want to use for a simple subject this morning, trading places. Trading places. Father, bless your word on today. Speak to us. Remind us. Inspire us of all the sacrifices that you have made so that we could even stand in this moment, show up in this place today. I step back. I step back, Lord, and ask you to step up in this moment so that we may be edified through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I might need a little bit of help on the monitors here, if you can. I want to do a play. I want to, I want to you, could, you could view the death of Christ from a lot of different angles, but this morning, I want to view the death of Christ from the perspective of Barabbas, the man that they chose to release in Jesus' stead, because in a lot of ways, Charlene, I can relate to him and his dilemma. Let me explain. When I was a kid, I had one of those uh, curious natures, uh, which is a nice way of saying I was always into something. <laughs> I was always into something I shouldn't be doing. I, I like pushing the envelope. I like breaking the rules. Yeah, curious nature. And so because they always got into a lot of trouble. And see, you have to understand that back then, y'all young folks don't know nothing about this, but back then our parents didn't believe in gentle parenting. Not like they do today. They didn't believe in gentle parenting. It wasn't like, little Derek, sit down in the corner, and I want you to think about what you did. And I want you to contemplate why you chose the decision that you made, and then we'll come back and discuss it later. <laughs> 
No. No, my mother believed in whoopings. Huh? She believed in whoopings. Now, now, now let, me, let me argue her defense. She was a single parent. Amen. She was a custodial parent. She was a single mom. She raised two kids, right? And she knew if she didn't catch me early and get a grip on me, she knew if she didn't teach me the consequences of bad decisions that she could be raising a menace to society. So early, Lee, she put the fear of God down in me, or at least the fear of my mother. I wasn't afraid of the police. I wasn't afraid of the principal. I was afraid of my mother. How many people got a mother like that? You can call anybody you want. Just don't call my mama. See, and I'm telling some of y'all right now, some of you parents, uh, I'm not advocating abuse. Let me, let me make it clear because somebody say he's talking about abusing people. I'm not advocating abuse. I'm not advocating mistreating people. But some of you right now, quite honestly, you're raising somebody's nightmare right now. You're raising somebody who does not respect authority, who will not follow rules, and while you're practicing gentle parenting and letting them get away without consequences, you are raising somebody's nightmare right now. Somebody's gonna be married to your son who does not follow rules, who does not respect boundaries, and she is gonna be crying because of a son that you raised. You're, you're raising somebody, somebody's raising a daughter right now is gonna be somebody's nightmare. You're raising people that don't respect authority, you're raising people who don't respect leadership, on no level, whether it be leadership for government, leadership in school, leadership at home, leadership at church, they have no respect, but my mama didn't play that. She didn't play that. She believed in whooping. Listen, listen, my mom put the fear of God in me so strongly that even as a grown man, as a grown man, I never talked back to my mother. I never disrespected her. I never cussed her. I, bless God, never raised my hand to her. I never stomped out the room and slammed the door while my mama was talking. Uh, even as a grown man, but the way I responded to her was always yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Because when I was two feet tall, she put the fear of God in me. She taught me respect. She taught me there are consequences to bad decisions because she knew one day I'd be a grown man. And some of y'all, you're waiting too late to straighten a kid out. I'm not going to bother because it ain't Mother's Day. Y'all getting tight up in here. My mother was so badly, she didn't have to call my father. She didn't have to call my father. She didn't have to call my uncle. She didn't have to call no police. She didn't have to call nobody because if I got in trouble, my mother would handle it. Y'all ain't got no mother like that. Yeah, my mother would handle it. Listen, if I got in trouble, there was consequences and there was repercussions. You hear what I said? There was punishment and it would be swift and severe. It wasn't no wait till your daddy get here. It wasn't like, let me call my uncle over here. No, baby, she would handle her business. And I would be in trouble. So I had a lot of times where my mama had to handle me. Because I had a penchant, Connie, for getting in trouble. But you know what? Parents aren't perfect. They ain't perfect. They ain't perfect. And so, to be honest with you, occasionally... I would get punished for something that I didn't do. And, and here's how. Here's how. Because I had cousins and I had friends who were just as mischievous as I was. Yeah, they were just as bad as I was. And we would all run together, Jill, and we would all get in trouble together. And the only problem is that is if something got broken, for example, if a lamp got broken or a window got broken, um, it was hard to determine who was responsible. Because we were all together. And we're not sure who broke the lamp. We're not sure who busted the window. We don't know who did it. And so because we couldn't determine or differentiate out of a group of boys who did the crime, guess what? We all. Y'all not talking to me this morning. Y'all woke. We, they all. We all got in trouble. Even if I didn't actually do it, I was punished as if I did I was guilty by association. Even if the rock wasn't in my hand and I was nowhere near the vase, I wasn't even in the room, 
Because I was around them who were, I was associated with them who were, we were all in there together, we could not determine who exactly did the deed, so guess what? We all caught it. Now let me say something to you. Now, I don't like taking punishment for stuff I didn't do. And see, it's one thing to be punished for something I actually did. You know what I'm saying? If you do the crime, you have to do the time. But it hits different when you're accused and you're punished for something that you didn't do. Are y'all out there? Can y'all hear me? Are these mics on good? It, it hits differently when you're accused for something that you didn't do. It has a different sting to it because after all, in order for you to receive any kind of mercy, you have to at least show remorse, right? You know, every once in a while you go crying to mama and say, mama, please, mama, please. And, 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 and if you did something wrong, sometimes, Carmen, if you showed some remorse for something that you did, if you broke the window and you got caught, uh, if you show a little bit of remorse for it, sometimes people would give you mercy to let you off. You follow what I'm saying? But for me, I'm one of them indignant individuals that I don't mind taking a licking for something I did, but I got a hard time taking a licking for something I didn't do. Is there something in me that stands up that said this is foul, this is injustice, and how do you express remorse for something that you never did? That's why uh, organizations like the Innocence Project are so important because they advocate for individuals who've been incarcerated or on death row who are innocent. In this United States, almost 5% or one out of 20 people are wrongfully convicted or on death row for a crime that they, get this, did not commit. And because they either couldn't afford nor could they get good legal representation, someone to represent them or prove them innocent, to plead their case, they may be accused, convicted, and executed for a crime that they did not commit. Isn't that something? That in this United States, because of the broken legal system we have, you could realistically be thrown into jail, be convicted, or find yourself on death row for something that you did not commit. And because you could not afford good legal representation, you were about to suffer because you could not prove your innocence. Forget the legal system. We're living in the age of the Internet. And with the Internet, you could be accused and convicted and executed in the court of public opinion. That somebody could say something about you that becomes viral, and it don't have to be true. And it would be true all over the country before any evidence or any proof is given. You could be tried, not just famous people, not just celebrities, but you as an individual. Has anybody ever been lied on in here? Has everybody ever been in high school and had somebody say something about you that took off like wildfire and everybody believed it even if it wasn't true? No facts, no information, no videos, no tapes, no nothing like that. And all of a sudden, everybody believed something about you and you were completely innocent. Some of those people who are sitting on death row right now, there are many people of recent years who have been exonerated because of, the, uh, of, because of technology and introducing DNA. And some people were waiting to be executed, waiting for years to be executed by the system, were finally exonerated because some DNA evidence has proven that they were actually innocent. What am I saying? Because there is injustice sometimes in the justice system. That is flawed. Any system that you have, any man-made system is going to have flaws. And so there are injustices in the flawed system that we have that allows people to suffer, who will go to their death chamber still declaring their innocent. Now, I'm not talking about those who belong there. I'm not talking about the people who know who did something and they belong there. I'm talking about there is a percentage, at least a small percentage of people who are there, and I shouldn't be here because I'm innocent. But that was not the case of Barabbas. <laughs> he, 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 Barabbas was a known offender. He was a robber. He was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. Barabbas had a law, had a rap sheet. This wasn't somebody they lied on or said something about or rumored on. He had a reputation for being a, get this, a lawbreaker. 
So when we start talking about Barabbas, please don't feel sorry for somebody and say they were falsely accused. History bears it out. The apostles bared it out. They all knew. The whole neighborhood knew this boy is bad news. This boy is somebody who had a reputation for breaking the law. An insurrectionist killed somebody, robbed somebody, and the whole community knew. Isn't it something? The worst thing you can have in your life is to have bad news, bad issues about you, and everybody know. Everybody know. They see you coming. There he is. Uh, there she is. They have a reputation so bad that when you come down the street, they already know what it is. Let me move on the other side of the street. I already know what this is. Some of us have been so bad and done so much dirt that we can't even go to our family's house because they already know how you do. Yeah, when you was out there stealing and robbing and smoking and doing all the things you were doing, we got family. Maybe I'll talk about myself. I got family right now. I've been preaching for 40 years. I got family right now that don't like me at their house because stuff I did when I wasn't saved. Y'all, I, y'all act like I'm the only one up in here that know what I'm even talking about. So, so, so Barabbas had a reputation, y'all. He had a rap sheet who just happened to be brought out the day that Jesus was being tried. Look at God. Who, out of all the people who were sitting in jail waiting for their sentence, he just happened to be brought out. He just happened to be the one they chose to bring out at the same time that they brought this Jesus. And here is the problem. Jesus was never a lawbreaker. So I brought out this known lawbreaker. This boy had a reputation. He had issues. We got a long list and history of things that he's done. He is unequivocally a lawbreaker and I got on the other hand Jesus Christ who was never a lawbreaker he never broke the laws of God he never broke Jewish law he would challenge their traditions but upon everything he did he never broke Jewish law he never even broke Roman government law to the point that the people who were trying him and examining him had to wash their hands of it and say, I don't see no fault in this man. I, I don't see where he's done anything wrong. Why are you bringing this guy to me? He hasn't broken any laws at all. Why is he even becoming an issue? But still, in spite of that fact, he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. Now, now let me go here. Crucifixion was the worst form of corporal punishment, reserved only for the most hardened criminals who committed the most heinous crimes. It was designed to be a slow, excruciating death where the victims suffered a long time before they finally succumbed. And that's what Jesus was facing. He was facing the worst capital punishment that you could ever face. He wasn't just facing a whooping. He wasn't just facing jail time. He was facing execution and suffering before he even got to die. And so and so when they had the choice between an innocent man and a known criminal, when the choices were put before the people. And and, and I must emphasize this was not their enemies. This was the Jews because it's always your own people. (laughs) When it was made a choice between an innocent man and a man who had a rap sheet as long as their arm, they chose by their own volition to let a criminal go free. They were more comfortable with a known criminal being released back into the community that Jesus was more of a threat to them than a known criminal who had a reputation for killing folk. And when the choice was asked to them and they begin to rub their chin, it was easy for them to make the decision. We want Barabbas. They tried to let him out of it, Charlene, and say, well, listen, I'm going to ask you one more time because maybe you didn't hear me right. Maybe this mic wasn't on. Do you want, do you want a murderer, a robber, a liar, an insurrectionist to be released back into your community to endanger your children and your livelihood and your families? Or do you want Jesus, this innocent man, to be released? And the Bible says, and they all, they all said, we want Barabbas. And so they chose to let a criminal go free, released from all charges, while an innocent man was sentenced to die. 
Now, now today, I want to look at this from the perspective of Barabbas. That's why I painted that picture for you. Because I want you, I want you to picture yourself being Barabbas. Because here's a prophetic picture of each of us, whether you believe it or not. Because he committed crimes that were worthy of death. He committed crime. There was no doubt he did the things he did. But because someone else was chosen to take his place that day, he was given the most valuable gift a man could be given, a second chance. Y'all not happy about that. The, the most valuable gift that anybody in this room can be given is a second chance. And maybe, maybe I'm talking to the wrong crowd. Maybe I'm talking to the do-good folks in here. Maybe I'm talking to the people in here who's always done good and always did right. But I wonder if there's anybody in here who's been like me and did some dirt. I'm talking to the people in here who know that, see, y'all dressed up today. It's Easter. You got your fancy suits on, your fancy dresses, and your hair is all done, your mother so-and-so, and your deacon so-and-so. But I want to talk to some people in here who've done some dirt who've done some mess. Who've, I'm not talking to people who ain't never smoked, ain't never lied, ain't never committed fornication. I'm not talking to the people in here who've never been a homosexual, never been somebody who stole or robbed or went to jail. I'm talking to some real people in here who've done some stuff, not just stuff we knew, but stuff we didn't know. I'm talking to some people in here who can be honest and say, I have done some things. Maybe I didn't do as bad as you did, but there's enough stuff I did. There's enough stuff I did that, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 see, 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 I, I'm glad we're living in an age, you know, I mean, I, I, see, we grew up in a time where they didn't have the internet. And they didn't have cameras on everything. And one of my brothers was talking about he had a camera on his eyeglasses. So he said, while I'm standing here talking to you, I can be recording you with my eyeglasses on. See, we live in that age now. But see, back when I was coming up, they didn't have those kind of cameras. And so you could almost get away with anything back then. And nobody knew it. Nobody saw it, y'all. But some of us in here who would be in deep now, if we had a camera on you back then, you'd have to tip out of here with one finger, y'all. Listen, listen, they, they were talking about this documentary called Freak Nick coming out on Hulu and all the parents back in that day was talking about, Lord, I hope I'm not on that video. My daughter called me and said, Daddy, was you at Freak Nick? I said, no, baby, I wasn't at, I, I wasn't at Freak Nick. I'm helping y'all young people out. Your parents wasn't as such a much as they are now. They was wild back in the day, too. They did some stuff. See, they sit there looking like the Rock of Gibraltar now, but they were doing some stuff, too. They were doing some stuff that they would take your head off for now. Don't let them fool you. Don't, don't let them pumps, pump. Don't let them old red bottoms fool you. Don't, don't let them fancy suits fool you. We did some. How many folks here can be honest and say, I did some, I did some? I did some stuff I don't want to be brought up. I did some stuff I don't want to talk about. I did some stuff I don't want to be dead. And the greatest thing that God can give you, my beloved, is a second chance. The greatest thing that God can give, the greatest gift he can give you is a second chance. When you think about all the things that you did and all the things that should have happened, you shouldn't be looking as good as you do right now. You shouldn't have even made it. You shouldn't have even survived it. That's why I don't understand why y'all sitting there looking at me on Resurrection Sunday like you watching a movie instead of giving God praise for giving you a second chance. And a th Is there anybody in here that God has given a second chance and a third chance? chance and a fourth chance would you give God praise if he did it you 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 ain't shouting good enough for me some of y'all done been on drugs and God brought you I wish you would sit there and act like you're not gonna give God a praise some of y'all were walking the street some of y'all were homeless some of y'all couldn't figure out how you were gonna keep your life together but God gave you a second chance slap somebody and say you're looking at a second chance looking at a second chance you, this preacher that you're listening to is somebody that God has given a second chance. I want to talk to some real people in here who will be given second chances, third chances, fourth and fifth chances. I want to talk to some people in here who've done some stuff since you've been saved. Huh? Yeah, look right this way. You did some stuff since you've been saved, and God covered for you. You did some, see, see, everything they said about you wasn't a lie. 
Uh huh. I'm going to go right there. Some of the stuff they said was a lie, but everything they said about you wasn't exactly a lie. There was a little bit of truth in the stuff they were saying, but God still gave you a second chance. Gave you a chance to pick it up, to clean it up, to fix it. Y'all, y'all ain't happy for me, enough for me. A second chance to fix it up, clean it up. Kept you, blessed you anyway. So, so here's, my, here's, here's, my, here's my rub here, because you always have a rub. Here's my rub here. I don't know, I don't know where Barabbas was when they were killing Jesus. The Bible doesn't say. I don't know where. When they were dragging Jesus from judgment hall to judgment hall. When they were whipping him like a dog. When they were beating him beyond recognition. When they forced him to carry a cross up the hill of Golgotha that he would soon be executed on. While they pierced his hands and his feet with nails. While he was caused to stand up to, to hang on a cross and die and suffer for hours. I wonder, I wonder where Barabbas was. I wonder if Barabbas watched this whole thing play out. Watch them snatch him out of the hall. Watch them beat him into oblivion. I wonder if he was standing nearby when he was crying out to his father, why have thou forsaken me? I wonder if he stood close by with an earshot when he was saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I wonder how close Barabbas was to hear his weeping mother crying and wailing as they crucified his son. I wonder if he was among those disciples who were walking around in bewilderment trying to figure out what do we do now. We thought he was going to overthrow Rome. We thought he was going to change everything. And now our leader, our pastor, our master, our savior, whom we followed for three years as teaching is suddenly thrown up on a cross, stripped naked in front of everybody. And left to hang there naked for hours. And we had to go. I wonder where Barabbas was. And I don't know, Lee. I don't know. But if, if I were Barabbas and I saw this scene play out in front of me. And I saw the agony and the pain and the torture. I would have been thinking it should have been me. If I were to witness all the things that were happening to him, hearing the whips and smelling the blood and the crowd that he was going through, I would have had to. And just a few moments, I was just a decision away. I was a decision away from suffering the same fate that there was a choice that could have been made and they chose him instead of choosing me. I would have been thinking it should have been me. That I was the murderer, and I was the lawbreaker, and I was the one who deserved it, but yet he got the punishment. I would have been thinking I should have been dragged through the streets like a dog. I should have had been whipped so many times that my entrails were hanging out. I should have been the one that had the crown crushed on my head until the spikes pushed into my brain. It should have been me. I should have been the one hanging on that cross. Agony. Why? Because I deserved it. I did the crime. I should have done the time. And see, when I think about this scene and what could have happened, Lisa, y'all sleepy. But I think about that song that says, it should have been me. Outdoors. With no food. And no clothes. This is why I don't understand why this place is not celebratory. Because when you think about the fact that it should have been you. That all the things that could have happened to you. That God didn't let it be. Is there anybody in here that can give God 30 seconds for the things that could have. That should have. That would have happened to you. Oh my God. When you think about the fact that I should have been on the cross. I should have been dead. I was the one who did the crime. I was the one who got in trouble. And yet he the punishment for something that I did and so in this moment I don't know I don't know where he was but that's that that's what I would have been thinking in this moment that I get to go scot-free 
and I was the one who did the crime, and he gets to be punished. And so in this moment that they let Barabbas go, he was able to participate in what the theologians call substitution. So write this down. Christ was our substitute. Write that down. That's number one. Substitution means to put one person or thing in the place of another, usually with the intent of benefiting another person. Read again. Substitution means to put one person or thing in the place of another, usually with the intent of benefiting another person. On the cross, Jesus became everything that God hated. He became sin, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, that he made him to become sin who knew no sin on, get this, on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, we switch places. And when God was mad and ready to pour out his wrath on man, he poured it out on Jesus. He became sin. He didn't do sin. He became sin to the point that even God himself turned his face away, at least for a moment, because Jesus became the very thing that he hated. Everything we deserve, he took it on himself. Jesus became poor so that we could be rich. He suffered the wrath of God so that we could have the favor of God. He became the object of God's anger so that we could have peace with God. That everything that God hated and he was going to give out judgment for, instead of it being you and you and you, he took somebody else who was innocent and poured out his wrath on him. And because he put his wrath on him, now I am a beneficiary of something that I did not deserve. Maybe that's the problem with this generation. We think we deserve everything. We think we're so good and so perfect that we deserve to be blessed. But in truth, reality, someone else paid for something that you should have had. And because he was willing to take on the wrath of God, now I get to come into God's presence and have the peace of God. That because he was willing to be poor, I now have access to have rich, to be rich, to be favored, to have resources because Christ was my substitute. Number two, Christ was our ransom. According to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus said, I came to give my life as a ransom to all. Can I say this to you, y'all? Favor is not free. Everybody running around here talking about, I got favor, I got favor, I got favor. But truth be told, favor ain't free. It was free to you, but it wasn't free. You are the recipient of favor. Freedom ain't free. You are the recipient of the favor. You are the recipient of the favor. You are the recipient of the blessing. But it didn't cost you anything, but it cost him everything. There's a price to be paid for. Jesus' death was ransom money. And ransom money is the price you pay to secure the freedom of a slave, releasing them from all charges and all liabilities. Truth be told, I was a slave to sin. Couldn't help myself. Couldn't help if I, didn't want, if I wanted to. And he released me, not just from the pull of sin, but he released me from the penalty of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, that sin has a cost attached to it. That all of us who were born under Adam even though we didn't do what Adam did, we were under the same debt because of our association. It's much like me and my cousins. Even if I didn't throw the rock, even if I didn't personally break the window, because I was with them who did, we all received the punishment. Even though the ones I didn't, even though, even though I did not do it. So even though you may not have done what Adam did. So somebody here right now said, well, Pastor, I never drank. I never smoked. I never fornicated. I never ran around. But because you are Adam's seed, because you are Adam's son, because you are a descendant of Adam, that sin is in your blood, yeah. that the price of sin is death, and that you were under a cost that you couldn't pay, the debt was, in, the debt was impossible to pay, and Jesus Paid the cost, and like Barabbas, check it out, y'all. I got to walk away scot free. I walked away scot free. Nobody was running around trying to put Barabbas in double jeopardy. 
Nobody was asking him about the murders he committed or the insurrections he committed. Nobody was running around talking to him about his past. He was set free by the court while another man died. And that's what I'm trying to say about some of you. I, for the life of me, can't figure out why the Christians are not celebrating on Easter Sunday, why we're not throwing chairs and running around this room. And maybe it's because we have not been convinced of our own wretchedness and our own sin and how close we were to judgment and how close we were to going to hell. But Jesus stepped up and said, I'm going to pay for her sin. I'm going to pay for her issues. I'm going to pay for her drama. And in exchange for that payment, I want her to walk in favor and walk in victory. That's why you're able to walk in favor. That's why you're able to walk in victory because somebody else paid for it. Oh my God. Is there anybody here that's glad that God paid for it? Clap your hands if you're glad that Jesus paid for it. Shouldn't be this hard to raise a shout in a house of blood-washed people. Shouldn't be this hard to raise a shout in a room full of people who recognize that if God hadn't saved me, I don't know who I would be. I don't know what I would be. I don't know where I would be. But somebody take 30 seconds and give God praise because he paid it. He paid it. I'm so glad he paid it. And so now I get to walk into something that I didn't even deserve. That's why you got to have humility. Because the truth be told, you didn't deserve it. With your cute self. With your smart self. With your degreed self. You still didn't deserve it. That you couldn't earn it. You couldn't buy your way into it. You just received it. Look how good God is who blesses you with overwhelming favor and you didn't even deserve it. You couldn't even earn it. That your righteousness is as filthy rags. That means when you come in God's presence, putting out your resume, talking about all the good works you did and all the people you helped, God said it still ain't good enough for me. When you talk about you gave, I gave $50 in church. That little $50, $100 you gave could not begin to touch what it costs you to have salvation. This is why I like the favor of God. Because the favor of God can't be earned. He just bestows it upon you he just get, is there anybody here that's glad that God bestows favor upon you that there were people who were more qualified there were people who were better people there were nicer people but God is there anybody God's ever bestowed something on you you know for a fact that you shouldn't even have what you have you shouldn't even have the car you have the clothes you have the house you have but God stepped over everything that was wrong with you and blessed you anyway that's what I love about God the truth be told it was the goodness of God that brought me out of sin it was the goodness of God that caused me to repent has anybody here that knows it like to have God treat you so good that you ashamed God you dumb you listen you've been so good to me I need to straighten up my act I shouldn't even be acting like this I shouldn't even be over here look at somebody say, this is what favor looks like this is what favor looks like. You trying to check my resume and Google search me and find out what kind of dirt I've done. But this is what favor looks like. Point at yourself. This is what favor looks like. This looks like this. When you had stuff wrong. When you've been caught red handed. When everybody knows your business. When your friends know your business. And bless God your family know all your business. But God still blessed you anyway. Is there anybody in here that God has blessed you let me talk on this side. Is there anybody over here who's glad that God blessed you anyway? I was smoking reefer, but he gave me a job anyway. I was high as a kite, but he blessed me anyway. I just stepped out of somebody's bed that I shouldn't have been in. But God is so good. He didn't judge me. He blessed me anyway. Would you take 30 seconds and praise God for blessing you, y'all? Yo, sit there, sit there, sit there, sit there. I got to praise God for myself when I think of the goodness of Jesus. And it, oh! Okay. I'm so tired of the saints talking about what they deserve. I deserve a good man. I deserve a house. You don't deserve nothing but death. Truth be told, we should all be on our way to hell with gasoline draws on. But because God... Who looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. 
Some of you, if God had closed the door too soon, you would have never made it in. If God had closed the door too soon on you, you wouldn't even be here right now. I dare you to sit there and act like you deserve it, but everybody that knows that God snatched you out just in time, would you jump on your feet and give God 30 seconds of praise? Listen, Leah, when I was doing my dirt, I used to always pray, God, I hope you don't come tonight. Or say, how many people know what I'm talking about? I, I'd be high as a kite, driving home. Driving home, say, Lord, I just hope Jesus don't come tonight. Crawling out somebody's bed, I hope, Jesus, I hope you don't come tonight. Doing so. See, y'all, they got. And look at God, who kept the door closed long enough, who opened, who kept back death long enough, who kept back disease long enough, who kept back jail time long enough for you to get yourself together. Would you give God praise for giving you time? He gave me time. He gave me time. He gave me time. Oh, I thank God for giving me time. I thank God for giving me time to get myself together. I thank God for giving me time to come out of it. I thank God for giving me time to grow up and get my head together. I thank God that they didn't lock me up for life. I thank God that I didn't contract something that they can't get off me. I thank God that they didn't bash my head in. I thank God that the car wreck didn't kill me. I thank God. Y'all not going to thank God in here. I thank God that he gave me time. He gave me time. He gave me time. If God didn't give me time, I would have never got it together. That's why you can't look down your nose at sinners because everybody in here done done something wrong. That's why you can't bash them for what they're doing. The only reason why you're here now is because God gave you time and pray God, give them time. How many here praying right now? Lord, save my son before it's too late. Save my daughter before it's too late. Save my husband before it's too late. Save my son before it's too late. And look at God, who looks past all your dirt and gives you time. How many times have I sat in a church service looking at my watch and couldn't wait to get back to my drugs? Couldn't wait to get back to my reefer? Couldn't wait to get back to that woman? Couldn't wait to get back to my dirt? And even while I was sitting here, God was giving me time giving you time. How many God, how many people thank God for time? Thank you for time. Thank you for time. I shouldn't have even been there. I shouldn't have even been in the room, but God gave me time. Oh, y'all thought I was talking about sinners. I'm talking about saints. I'm talking about elder so-and-so and mother so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so singing in the choir and so-and-so playing the instrument. I'm talking about God giving you time. Thank God for giving me grace. Somebody shout grace. Grace didn't let the liar kill me. Grace didn't let the rumors destroy me. Grace didn't let them throw me in a hole and throw away the key. Would somebody give God 30 seconds for giving me grace? Oh, y'all get on my nerves. The saints get on my nerves. Don't let me start getting prophetic in here and start calling out your dirt and walk into a world of knowledge. You better give God a praise and give you time. Oh, Lord. You gave me time. That's why I celebrate Resurrection Sunday. I couldn't wait to go to church. Because I've seen a time on a Sunday morning, I'd have just been getting up with a drunken stupor. That I'd be getting up with a headache. That I'd be getting up hungover, thrown up in somebody's toilet. But I'm in the house today. Somebody, you're not in somebody's jail today. Somebody in here, you're not in somebody's psych ward today. I'm so glad that God gave me time. If I don't get no new car, he gave me time. If I don't get no new house, he gave me time. If I don't get a husband, he gave me time. Time for what, pastor? Time to get myself together. Time to get myself right. Time to repent. Time to come out of it. Time to get away from it. Time to give up on it. Would somebody give God 30 seconds for giving you time? Last 
thing I want to say is Christ is our advocate. He is our substitute. He is our ransom. And he is our advocate. The Bible said in Hebrews 7, 7 verse 25 that Jesus forever lives to intercede with God on our behalf. That when Christ was crucified, he raised him from the dead. And now he sits on the right hand of God to be our advocate, to plead on our behalf. He sits on the right hand of God pleading our case still. Why? Because we still make mistakes. There he stands on God's right hand saying, Lord, give him time. Bless him anyway. He made a mistake, but I'm praying for him. She had issues. She fell last night, but I'm praying for her. It also reminds me of what he did with Peter. He said, Peter, the enemy desired to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Jesus is praying for somebody's faith right now. You're having a hard time, but I'm praying for your faith. Other people have walked away from you and said you're nothing, but God said, I'm praying for your faith. I'm praying for something to stand up in you. That though a righteous man falls seven times, he'll get back up. That though you've fallen several times and though you made mistakes and you still make mistakes, it's not like you haven't made mistakes, but it didn't kill me. Judgment didn't come in my house. I didn't have disease or death because Jesus is praying for me. How many people know that Jesus is praying for you? See, it's one thing for your prayer partner to say, I'm praying for you. And they have access to God. It's another whole thing for Jesus to say, I'm praying for you. Oh my God. I, I, my prayers are efficacious. My prayers work. I'm sitting right there on God's right hand right now saying, Lord, bless him. Lord, keep him. I know she lost her temper, but I still want you to bless her. I know she didn't do right last night, but I still want you to bless her. I know he's not acting like he's supposed to, and he's acting a fool, and he's not serving me right, and he's still doing his dirt, but God, I want you to bless him. How many people are glad that Jesus is praying for me? me he's praying he's praying for me he's pleading my case like an attorney here's what's funny you can have an attorney represent you but they're never going to take your place they could go to the court and argue and fight but when them sentences are handed out I've never seen a lawyer say tend me to jail instead of him Execute me instead of him. But look at our advocate who didn't just advocate for us, but stood in for us. Lord have mercy. Who didn't just argue for my defense, but became the person that should have gone to jail. Oh, Lord. And he took my place. And now he stands on the right hand of God to advocate for me. Is there anybody in here that needs God to pray for you? Oh, come on, come on, somebody. I, 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 I admit I have moments of doubt and moments of fear and moments of worry and moments of stress. And I need God that if my friends get sleepy, Connie, and go to bed, that he's still praying for me. And that God hears his prayers on my behalf. On my behalf. So on this Resurrection Sunday, I just want to remind you of what God has done for you. Took your place, traded places with me. I took off my filthy rags. He took on my wrath. He took on my guilt. I took on his righteousness. That he was my ransom. He paid a price for me that I, I couldn't begin to pay. And he still lives now as my advocate. Been saved 40 years. Been preaching 30. And still in all that time, I can think of all the places where I took wrong turns and made mistakes and did dumb stuff. In a lot of ways, Charlene, I'm still that little boy my mama had to straighten out because I had a curious nature. And the times I got myself into things that I knew I shouldn't have gotten into. And the times the enemy set traps for me. 
traps, snares for me. For the times he blocked me in a corner, Adrian, and said you would never get out. But because somebody prayed for me. Because Jesus prayed for me. I came out of it. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he had you on his mind. The Bible says he endured the cross. He put up with it. He took it. He stayed there for hours. Could have called angels to come down and get him off, but he didn't. Because if Jesus had come down off that cross, you would still be bound. You would still be an alcoholic. You would still be a prostitute. You would still be lost and had no destiny. If he had come down off that cross, I know you're proud of your degree. But you don't even realize that the intelligentsia that you have is because he had you on his mind. He told Shabbat. Hold on, Shia. That those things are not as good as I like them to be. They're not as bad as they could have been. So you thank God for the things that you saw that he rescued you out of. But what I'm learning to thank God for is for the things I didn't see. For the stuff that could have happened to me. For the stuff that should have happened to me. For the things that could have gone wrong. I, I made a left instead of a right, but if I just made a wrong turn, I wouldn't even be here today. That if God didn't shut off the enemy and cut him off at the pass, that I wouldn't even be here. For me to have the luxury to get dressed up and come in here and chew gum in the service <laughs> is a luxury that I didn't even know I had because I didn't know all the things the enemy had planned for me. You should have saw the thing that the devil had planned for you. Planned for you. From the moment you hit this planet, the enemy had plans to destroy you. Do you not know that the prison system is making plans for kids as young as second and third grade? That in your second and third grade, that they're making plans, they're building prisons with kids who are in the second grade. They're making plans for you. Investing money and infrastructure waiting for you to arrive. And for some of you, the streets were waiting for you. They were waiting for you. They were waiting for you to get old enough to try this new drug, to sell these drugs. They were waiting for you to get big enough. There are pimps right now who are hanging outside of elementary school saying, I'm just waiting for her to get old enough to put her on a corner. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't, don't want to talk to me. That while you're rocking them babies on your knee, that there's a devil who is waiting to destroy that baby. Hoping to catch you slipping. Hoping you're not on your guard and on your post. Hoping you get distracted with some man and not paying attention to your child. Waiting for you. Waiting for you. There are some drugs out here that don't give you a chance to do it three, four times. They get one hit, one time, one opportunity. It is a wrap. It is over. You are done. And the devil is waiting. Smoke one bad thing of weed and it's over. Slip something in your drink at a bar and it's over. Sleep with the wrong person and don't know they got a disease you can't get off here and it's a wrap. It's over. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You think they just love you. They done love 50 people before they got to you. How dare you think you're the best thing they ever had? You were just the dumbest thing they ever had. Waiting. Waiting. The plan has been launched. The plan has been hatched. They're hoping that you don't pay attention. They're hoping that you brought up in a house where you have a father or a mother or neither who's not paying attention. My mother would stand at the door and be waiting for you. She had rules. She had rules. You see that street light come on? You better bring your hips in here. 
Come on, somebody. My mother had rules. It was like when I got older, 11 o'clock, you better be in this house because the doors will be locked. And the, if you're not here at 11 o'clock, baby, listen, and you better not leave this porch. She wasn't being mean. She was trying to protect me. She knew what the streets were. She knew what was out there. She knew, and I did get into some stuff, but it wasn't nowhere as bad as I could have been into because there was something in my mind that said, child, I got to go home. My mama, my mama don't play. I'm trying to tell you something. There's a God who loves you. Who's saying it's time to come home. It's time to come home. I've given you time. I've given you grace. I've given you opportunities. I've let you hear sermon after sermon and message after message. I've listened while you criticize preachers and churches and say it ain't real and saying it don't matter and say it don't. And I allowed you to have all those criticisms, but I gave you time to come to yourself. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Perhaps there's somebody in here right now. Maybe you came because somebody invited you to come. Maybe you're watching because it's Easter Sunday. And traditionally on Easter, I got to go to church with my mom and them get dressed, be in somebody's church because it's Easter. Maybe you came to be entertained. Everybody was putting out all kind of advertisement on social media. Come to our church. We, we dropping Easter eggs out the sky. We, <laughs> we giving away gold cookies. <laughs> Everybody has some sort of advertisement to get you in the door and in the building. The only thing I have to offer you is Jesus. To tell you that he died for you, that, that he's willing to trade places with you and to make you his child. I want to cut a deal with you today. If you slip your hand up in the air, I want to pray for you. I'm not glad you to come up. I'm glad you, I just want to pray for you. For everybody in here who needs to give you a life, I see the hands. I see the hands. I hope my ministers are paying attention. I see the hands. I see the hands. Pray for me, preacher. I'm a sinner. I'm out here. I'm out here in a big way. I'm out here in a way that they know me in these streets. <laughs> I'm not no secret squirrel. I'm a big sinner. I'm like Paul. I'm a chief of sinners. Some people in here know me. But thank God you know me. Keep those heads bowed, those eyes closed. Father, I'm praying for every hand that's up today. For every hand that knows they need salvation. For every hand that knows I need to give my life to Jesus. That this is the moment for me. This is the moment that changes everything. I realize what you did for me. I realize that I shouldn't even be here. I realize that you gave me time. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for a chance to hear this preacher. And now I, I, I want to do more than just hear, Lord. I want to respond to this word. You've touched my heart. And I want to give my life to you. So, Lord Jesus, I'm praying for every hand. That you would touch them, that you would deliver them, that you would, as they reach out to you, that you, God, would save them in Jesus' name. Now, now keep your heads down, your eyes closed. For every hand that went up, I want you to take one more step of faith and go a step further. If you raised your hand, I want you to come to this altar right now to give your life to Jesus, wherever you are. Every hand that went up. I see you back there, young man. I see you on this side. I need everybody standing right here. Everybody standing because I don't want them to step over top of you. If you raise your hand, I want you to move quickly to this altar. My ministers are in position right now. Hallelujah. Somebody should be rejoicing right now. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. I need every minister on this altar because they're coming. They're coming. For every soul, come on, young man. Come on, daughter. Come on up here. Give you, yes, come on up here. Come on and give your life to Jesus. Come on. Come on. Come on. I saw your hand. Come on. Come on, they're not going to hurt you. We just want to pray for you. We just want to lead you to salvation. I need every minister to minister to them and lead them to salvation right now. There's still more coming. There's still more coming. Come on. This is what it was all about. There's still more coming. There's still more coming. There's still more coming. Come on, Catherine. Come on, Connie. There's still more coming. There's still more coming. I'm giving my life to Jesus. They're all over on the right-hand side. They're on the left-hand side. Come on. This is what we came for. Come on, Jill. Let the Lord use you. This is what we came for. 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 
Somebody celebrate. Somebody celebrate these souls coming to Jesus right now. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I'm trading places today. I'm trading places. Somebody's a backslider today. You've been out there way too long. God's been giving you enough grace. God's been giving you enough mercy. But it's time for you to come on in. You know you don't belong out there. You're doing what you want to do, but you don't like what you're doing. You're into some stuff right now. And you're trying to get out. This is your opportunity to get out. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for taking my place, Jesus. Thank you for giving me a chance. Thank you for getting me out of trouble. Thank you for taking the taste out of my mouth. Thank you for saving my family. Thank you for breaking the yoke right now in the name of Jesus. I wish I had some praying people in here. I wish I had some praying people in here. I wish I had some, some participators and not just some spectators. Hallelujah. 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 You ought to be glad. I need some saints to be glad. This was you one time. This was you one time. Somebody's son getting saved. Somebody's daughter getting saved. Somebody's family getting delivered. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, break up every chain and break up every fetter, loose the power. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody that's glad about what God is doing, give him praise right here. Somebody that's glad about what God is doing, give him praise right here. Bring that young man right here. Bring that young man right here. Lay my hands on him right here. In the name of Jesus. Holy Ghost, take over. Leah, where you at? Come here, Leah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I break every chain here. And I break every fella loose the bound. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Break it. I commanded to be broken. I commanded to be broken. Loose your hold, devil. Loose your hold. Loose your hold. I wish I had some praying saints in here. These young people are getting free. I wish I had some praying. They think we playing in here. Hallelujah. 